What's going on guys? So in this video, I'm going to talk about starting over in your 30s. This is part one. Uh, this is going to tackle the reason why I'm comfortable doing this, starting over. Um, for the most part, we call it starting over, but it's really just um, uh, going on to a, a path you think will be more successful overall. Now, here's the situation, okay? When I was 16 or actually 15 and a half, my stepdad passed away. He passed away the June before my, I'm sorry, January before my birthday in June. So when he passed away, um, life changed because now immediately it all structure. My mom started, you know, literally just smoking weed all day, not knowing where she's at. Um, all these fake people, you know, they called herself family, came out of nowhere, um, influencing my mom to make these irrational decisions. Um, that caused me to have to fend for myself, um, which is what gave me the drive because of my stepdad pushed me to work hard. Um, I didn't get nothing for free. I had to earn everything, which I'm happy he instilled that in me. But um, my mom, she literally was not able to provide anything because she um, went through all the money that she had um, and he got because of the life insurance policy quick, which is kind of where I learned the terrible spending practices that I engage in. But she was under the influence of so-called family and friends. And I decided to go get a job, which I got this job at a call center, MCI. So I went from, I, I got that job actually when I was 16. So about, let's say eight months after his death, uh, I turned 16, I was able to get a work permit and I started working. So that was my first journey or, or introduction to money, real money, because prior to that, I used to sell candy and you know do little hustles like that, sell CDs. You remember when you used to have CDR drives, CR, CDR drive, W drives, you used to sell CDs. I used to sell whatever I could sell to make money, but now I can actually get a real job. So I started working at um, this MCI call center and I started getting $500 a week. After like the second month, I'm getting $500 a week because I was um, making 500 in natural pay. And then I, the next week I would make $500 in commission check. So I was making about 2,000 a month. Mind you, I'm a 16 year old uh, kid, high school kid. So now my life changed because I got money coming in and I'm working and you know, I kind of um, pushed away, moved away from basketball and all that um, when I started making that money. Um, so now you're in the second year, senior year of me working this job. Um, now I decided to make this dumb decision at the time, but smart one if I would have stuck with it, but I, it was taking me away from my school and it was taking me away from uh, basketball that I actually had a passion for and I wanted to play basketball. So I decided to leave that job to go work at McDonald's, which was a terrible decision, but it allowed me to play on a basketball team. But I was in this computer tech program and I actually got um, an F because of a project that um, I missed by like five points and that ended the season for me because I wasn't able to play, you know, uh, on the team. I had to quit or they had to cut me because of grades. So I just quit this job, um, MCI, uh, a month or so before to play basketball and I started working at McDonald's. So now that was the first terrible decision, you know, when it came, come to my work life. So now I'm working at McDonald's and um, I worked at McDonald's until the end of the school year. So now I'm a senior, I'm sorry, I'm a, I, I actually didn't even graduate, I didn't get to walk across stage. I had to go to a small school because I missed one class uh, because of attendance. I missed one class that I had to go and I actually graduated before the rest of my, my uh, class. But they didn't let me walk across stage because I didn't really fight for that, which I wish I would have um, at that time, but I just let it go. I just said, you know what, why do I care? Mainly due to the fact of not having a stepdad there to you know, smack some sense into my head, like, dude, what are, you, what are you doing? So I graduated high school, and at this time, I'm still working at McDonald's. Uh, I'm going to the YMCA, which was convenient, McDonald's early, and then I would go to the YMCA every day because I used to love basketball. So I met this guy um, who had this bar downtown. It was called Martini's. So he see me hooping. You know, I used to, like, be good at defense. I'm dunking on people, blocking everybody's shots. You know, uh, kind of tall, tall, the tall black guy out there. So he's like, hey, we got this team. Um, we play, I forgot the name of the city, but it's like Maslin, not Maslin, but it's Maslin or whatever um, in Ohio. Um, you should come play. 
like I'll pay for you to play in every day. So I started playing on his team and I'm doing what I do. Every game I got like two or three dongs, I'm blocking shots, whatever, whatever. So like the second or third game, he's like, so what you, you know, we're, we're, we're becoming cool. He's like, so what you do um, for a living? Like what you got going on? I'm like, yeah, I'm at McDonald's, whatever at the time. Or I might've been at Wendy's. I was at one of the fast food places. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm just working fast food. I'm about to start school coming up. He's like, well, I have a restaurant right next door to the Y. You can come and work some extra, you know, extra hours. You can work part time. I'm like, cool. So I started working for this guy, and he convinced me into switching from computer tech to uh, doing uh, food. I forgot the name of. Um, um, I'm trying to think, what was it called? Hospitality management. He taught me into doing hospitality management. So I go, and I remember. I go to the first like orientation at YSU, Youngstown State University, and the chef came in, like trying to be like one of those chefs off of the TV shows. He comes in like, listen guys, I'm gonna start off by saying, if you can't deal with working 80, 90 hours a week in a hot kitchen, getting yelled at all day for crappy pay for the first five to 10 years, you need to walk out right now because this ain't for you. Like this is a crappy industry, terrible industry that is miserable, but if you have the passion for cooking, passion for um, you know putting together events, blah, 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 uh, running the business, then this is for you. You can make a lot of money in it, but you gotta put in your, your, your work. You gotta put in your time. And I didn't walk out because I'm like, I'm not a quitter. I'm gonna just go to the floor. Even though I hate cooking, I don't even, I didn't even wanna do it. I just got you know influenced to, to do this because the guy made it seem like if I got this this management, um, you know, this, this degree, uh, hospitality management, I would be able to run his bar. So I go the first semester and I started, you know, I'm doing good, uh, everything's great. But then he starts uh, being a little funny with my hours. Like he started, cause he decided to open up another bar across town uh, in like the suburbs. And he started like, I would work like 40, 50 hours each week. He started cutting my hours but then he started like not paying me some hours. So before, if I was in the restaurant, uh, even if I wasn't working, because sometimes he would want me there early just in case he was busy, I'd still get paid. But he started like not paying me for hours that I was there early because he wanted me there just in case there was a rush. So I'm dealing with that. Then he started like looking for a new manager. Mind you, we I'm cooking out of a restaurant that has uh, no stove, just we got a crock pot, uh, a skillet and a microwave, toaster and a toaster oven. I'm pu I'm putting together five star meals. People think like I'm making steak and all that out of this kitchen with no stove, no oven. You know, a toaster oven. And he decides with the other restaurant he needs a real chef because he made me the chef but, um, at, of this little restaurant that was next door to the YMCA downtown Youngstown. So he's throwing out numbers like, yeah, I'm gonna pay this guy, you know. 50, 60,000, which is good in Youngstown. Uh, and I'm like, am I just chopped liver? Like you groomed me into being this guy and met, yes, I'm not a chef, but I should be getting some type of, hey, if you stick, in, you stick it, if you hang in there with me, then I'm gonna increase your rate, especially if you finish school, blah, blah, blah. But no, he was cutting my hours, wasn't paying me all my hour, uh, uh, the hours I was working. So this was like a pivotal point because at this point, I'm like, what do I do? I quit my other job to work with this guy. I'm in school for hospitality management that I hate. I don't care about, I don't like food, I like cooking food. What do I do? And that was the first time that I had to make a change in my life. I had worked for this guy for about a year and a half and I ended up just quitting. I literally just told him I'm done. Like, you're not paying me properly, I'm out. You know, cause I don't see any future in this. So I go and stop talking to the guy completely because he was just, you know, started being shady. Good guy, but you know, the money always, everybody just screws me out of money for some reason. You know, you guys tell me in the comments why you think. Maybe I'm just too nice. So at this point, I walk away from that situation. I'm like 19 and a half, 20, okay? So now I switch my, um, my um, I switch my major to business management. And I go and I join a fraternity because that second semester I was, you know, I had a fraternity guy come up to me like, hey, join, you should join our fraternity because of this, that, and this, and that. I'm like, okay, you know what? Um, cheap rent, 
the guys were cool. They treated me like an individual, not like, you know, this black guy. Because in Youngstown at the time, in, in 2005, you know, it was like, you got, you just hung with your race. But this is the first experience I had where um, it was no race. It was just, everybody was just cool. Asian, black, white, everybody. Hispanic, we were all just cool. So I do that, I'm doing business management, and I go about two more semesters. I'm mediocre, I'm about a 2.6, 2.8, which is bad, but average. Um, I'm getting through. I got about um, two and a half years left, because mind you, I forgot to mention that when that happened with the, the restaurant, um, I ended up flunking that semester. I stopped going to school for the, for the third semester, and then I came back and started fresh with the business management. Um, um, to get the business management degree. So I go and I was good. I was in that fraternity for about three semesters. Now, with all the credits, and I'm trying to get bachelor, I have about a year and a half left before I would graduate. Actually, I'm sorry, two years left before I would graduate. So I go and I'm in the fraternity, I'm working labor ready, these odd jobs, and I, have, I get a job at KFC. Everything's going good in my life. My uncle, the one that I inherited the money comes, um, comes into town and he was sick. You know, he had like an incident to where he had to get his car impounded. He, had, he was stuck out in DC and he had to get like a taxi or whatever to bring him back to my grandfather's house. So he calls me up and, you know, he talks me into driving him to Washington to pick up his car. And that's when I found out that he was living well above my means. Uh, so he comes in, he, he starts asking me to drive him to Washington, D.C. I'm working at KFC, I'm in school. And it got to the point that he was calling KFC like like literally every single day to try to get me fired on a low. Like he would call and cuss out the manager if she didn't put me on the phone. And all he would tell me, she didn't tell me though that he was doing it. She was like, you gotta tell your uncle to stop calling. Like this is too much. And at the time I had a cell phone, but he would call in the restaurant on purpose that he wanted me to you know, get in trouble. He would get get on the phone and say, hey, can you make sure you bring me a uh, four piece with a biscuit and some macaroni and cheese? And then when he was tell, tell me what he wanted, he would stretch out the conversation. So it got to the point that he did this for like three straight weeks to the point that the manager fired me in a nice way. So at this point, I'm like going in on him. I'm like, dude, like you cost me my job. I'm like, I can't do this. Like you got it, like you got enough uh, with insurance and, and I didn't know he had money at the time. I'm like, you can hire a, uh, a whatever you call them, nurse, whatever. They'll do all this for you. So he's like, no, you know, I can't afford it. You know, sob story. So I, now I'm out of a job. I'm back working at Labor Ready, which is this temporary place where you work today, you get paid today. And I'm still in school. So he calls me and he offers me like $150, $200 to drive him to DC, which I'm jumped on, jumped on because DC was only four and a half hours away and I can get back the same day and I make $150, $200. So I drive him up to DC and we leave late because he had to go, I mean, we get there late because he had to go to the bathroom like 10 times, literally. Every half an hour, I got stopped for the bathroom. So we get to the impound lot, like literally 12 minutes late. It was like 5, 12. They were closed at five. I fought them to death to try to get that car out and they wouldn't allow us to get the car until the next morning. Because of my uncle, instead of him being respectful and nice, he started cussing them out because of like an extra $15 fee that they said they're gonna charge us, even though we're there technically the same day, but no, they're gonna charge us an extra $15 late fee and another day rate. So he's cussing them out, so they just said no, and they shut the gate and made us leave. So instead of getting a hotel room, he's like, we can just go to my house that they're remodeling. I didn't know this guy had a house with the elevator in it and all of that, okay? It was an amazing house. So we get to the house and you know, he shows me the house and he's like, you know, if you want, you can just come move here. You can work from, from DC and this and that, this and that. And I'm like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Because at the time I had, you know, I'm not getting into the situation, but you know, the um, ex put like, uh, put somebody on me that was not mine biologically. And I thought they were mine biologically. So I didn't want to leave that situation in Youngstown, but I didn't want to bring that situation into Washington DC because I couldn't afford to. You know, I didn't have a job, I had nothing going on. So I decided, I, I, I turned away his offer, I'm like, I can't do it right now because, you know, I don't want to be stuck and have a messy situation going on. I gotta stay in Youngstown for the time being. So next day we go pick up his car, we drive back to Youngstown, um, and another few weeks go by. 
I'm back working at Labor Ready, do odd jobs for money. Um, he calls and my grandfather actually calls me and said, look, I had enough of him. He's just too much. I'm putting him in a nursing home. So um, he goes to nursing home and on the way to nursing home, he has an attack, whatever, asthma attack, whatever, a panic attack. So they took him to the hospital. He pretty much stroked. So he didn't have use of half of his body now. He already, he was missing one leg. He was missing one leg um, already. So he had a hard time getting to the bathroom. He was just lacking motivation. And my grandfather couldn't deal with him because he would literally use the bathroom in the room. My grandfather, it smelled the whole house up. My grandfather had to like, like feed him. And you know, he was acting like he's a kid, but he's not. He was able-bodied man. He had the leg, prosthetic leg. He could have did everything on his own, but he was just you know, mentally checked out. So um, he goes to this, um, this, this hospital and he was just tapped out. like. He lost uh, control of half of his, you know, side of his body and his face was kind of drooped. So I felt bad. And they put him out, he was in the hospital for like a few weeks and they put him in a rehabilitation um, center. He was going crazy because he, actually I jumped the story. He was in that hospital. So he told me to go get gas because like he, um, you know, he just, he wanted me to go get him food and all this and that, whatever, whatever, whatever. And actually I jumped the story even more than that. Let me get back to the point ahead. He was in the hospital. I didn't know nothing other than he um, had a medical issue, you know, because of the fact um, uh, he had something going on health wise. So I put him in his re rehab center and he was miserable there. He hated it. Um, he talked me into letting him come stay at my place. I had a two bedroom apartment that was huge on campus. It was like 600 a month. Uh, I could afford it. It was, my bills were like a thousand dollars at the time. So I go and um, I say, okay, you know what? You're my uncle, you know, you, I got love for you. You come move in. He came, he didn't pay no rent or nothing. The only thing he did was buy food here and there, like sea staples, if you guys know what that is. He would buy food uh, for the house. And then I also let my cousin, uh, or I call him my cousin, but it's not by blood. Um, he slept on the couch. Um, and then I had my ex at the time with the baby in my room. So this is going on for a few months. So then my uncle, he started getting out of control again. He's like, it got to the point that he's like throwing urine bottles at me. And if I don't come to his room at a certain time, if I'm at work and I don't answer the phone, he starts like freaking leaving me crazy voicemails. So now I'm like, dude, like this is getting too much. So I'm like, hey, I got a trip to DC. I mean, um, New York, cause this is when I was, I told y'all I was selling, buying and selling phones and odd stuff. So I go to New York and this is probably like three months into it. I go to New York, he's okay. Because at this point I motivated him enough to um, do things on his own. Like go to the bathroom. You know, I brought his spirits back up because it was a fight, but I brought his spirits back up. My grandfather appreciated this because he was literally broken down as a man. And I brought him back to like being, you know, functional adult. So he goes and um, when, I'm in, um, when I'm in New York, he had a moment to where he went and see that he went and um started panicking and he called 911 because he was having an asthma attack whatever i thought that he was doing this for attention but he really was having an asthma attack and they had to break my gated door down which cost me like 400 dollars to replace um and they took him to the hospital and at this point he was committed like they made him stay in the hospital for like a few weeks and then after they made him go to a rehab home because of that incident it kind of backfired on him, but to this day, I don't know if he over, he over his ass race a lot. I don't know if he did or not with that situation, but he may have really been down because my grandfather asked me where I was at and where's the key to get in before my uncle decided to call 911. So he didn't even have to, it wasn't that serious. You know, my uncle, he just goes overboard sometimes. So I think that he might've like not been bad, but then he decided to exaggerate it. Okay. So, now, um, I, my uncle is in the hospital and he asked me to go to the ATM machine. This was the start of the money situation. He says, hey, you can go get gas and then you can take out a little extra to get food, uh, some sea staples or whatever. I'm like, okay, cool. Which he wasn't allowed to have in the hospital. I had to sneak it into him. So I go, I get him food. I, I, mean, I pull out the money and he told me to bring a receipt. And I know he did this on purpose. I get, the pull, I pull out the cash, I get the receipt and the balance is like $60,000. I'm like, wow, like this guy literally, I'm over here struggling 
and this guy got it going on. So now you have a situation where um, he now tells me anything I need, go ahead and get. You know, he said, just hold on to the car, anything I need, get. Worst thing that could have happened to me, a guy with no type of sense of uh, money, uh, financial literacy, having access to that kind of money, that was the start of everything. So now I'm gonna get into part two in the next video and tell you guys what happened when I got that debit card and how the life changing, you know, restart of my life happened. But that's part one. I'm gonna get into part two um, a little later on um, tomorrow. But that's all I got for now, I'm out, peace.